Hello, everyone. I'm Zeynep. Um, I am um, the moderator of this panel today. Uh, we are pre-recording the panel, so uh, there will be some uh, space for us to share our uh, ideas, but uh, we won't be um, receiving questions from the audience. But I myself be in LA during the uh, Getting Real 2020, so we can always talk. Uh, if we see each other in one of the community hubs. Um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, introduce myself and then introduce the, uh, the our panelists today. And also we'll make a short introduction uh, through our panel called Loaded Money, what it means, what it takes. Um, I'm Zeynep, as I said, I'm based in Berlin. Uh, I'm a filmmaker and an industry uh, professional uh, working on different festivals and uh, industry platforms, as well as uh, last year I joined the uh, um, Berlinale Talents uh, Dog Station uh, team, and uh, at the moment I'm a consultant of Documentary Association of Europe. I also uh, work with the marvelous team of uh, Getting Real 2020, the programming team, Abby, uh, Jonathan, Chris, uh, and um, was with them as a consultant of the of the panel and the conference series. Um, actually, this panel idea came out through our uh, fruitful discussions um, about what it takes to make um, a, a film as a documentary maker, or what it takes to decide like uh, about the films and filmmakers when you're a decision maker. So. All these topics uh, revolves around um, questions of money, funding, where this funding uh, comes from, what, the, what is the sources of the, of the money, could we really relate ourselves with the decision making processes as a filmmakers or as decision makers, while we are keeping our uh, relationship with the artistic integrity or the filmmakers' autonomy while we are uh, being in touch with them working with them. And at the same time, um, there are some sources that we know that there uh, has the anonymous funding, hidden sponsored content or organizations whose funding and platforms are forms of uh, art washing. But also uh, we will together think about, I think I find it quite important uh, that um, funding distribution in the world uh, in terms of uh, different um, countries or regions who have access or have limited access to sources of funding and um, other contexts uh, that has like a more stronger funding structures. So that those questions of like uh, can be also asked through the, the global north and the global south filmmaking and filmmakers and the platforms who are supporting filmmakers. Um, I'd like to uh, actually start um, uh, re presenting our speakers today. Uh, first of all, I'd like to say two things, actually. One of our speakers, Tiny Mungwe, she's based in South Africa, uh, Cape Town, and she's experiencing right now a major electricity uh, power cut, uh, cut. So uh, she will join us later and I will, go, I will be talking to her uh, when she could make, to make uh, herself available to join us. Um, maybe I can um, introduce her very shortly, she's, although she's not here yet. She's a filmmaker and arts manager. Uh, she works at Steps in South Africa she's producing for the emerging filmmakers and the framework framework of generation africa and it's already a collection of 25 documentary films that has been produced in 16 different african countries she's also quite active in the different film markets like uh, durban film mart um yeah we'll we'll have the chance to talk to her uh, i guess right after the session I'd like to continue with my other guest speakers here with us, Megan Gelstein. Megan is um, uh, herself has been um, uh, 
producer uh, some years ago. Uh, she's an Emmy Award winning producer. But right now she's the co-director and chief program officer of Catapult Film Fund. Uh, she is working and supporting with uh, supporting filmmakers and cultivates independent cinematic nonfiction, uh, nonfiction filmmakers. And she works globally with the filmmakers that uh, she's providing creative strategic and editorial um, advice to them all year round, uh, according to, based on her um, experience as a producer and also a funder now. Um, I'd like to also introduce, uh, now we have Lisa with us, Lisa Calif. I was going to make a note about her, but she joined, that's great. So maybe I can introduce you, Lisa. Um, Lisa is, um, yeah, I mean, I have to say that like our speakers today has all different backgrounds, which is a very good uh, combination of uh, having this fruitful actually conversation. Uh, Lisa is a partner at Donald Calif and Perez um, art firm, um, sorry, law firm, but dealing with a lot of entertainment uh, productions, especially specialized in representing independent um, producers and production companies mostly in documentary and uh, she's actually working in content creation from development to the later uh, phases like distribution and clearance. We also have Tamara David with us. Uh, Tamara is an Ethiopian Canadian filmmaker. Uh, her last title, the film's title is Finding Sally, which is released 2020. She's not just a filmmaker, she's also working uh, in the Canada Media Fund as a vice president of growth and inclusion. And I, as far as I uh, know that she's also a board member in Racial Equity, Equity Media Collective and also the founder of it in Canada. Uh, so lots of things to uh, share and talk about actually while I'm thinking about your profile as well, Tamara. And lastly, uh, our um, last guest speaker um, is Ezra Winton. Hi, Ezra. Ezra is a film creator as well as uh, he is a professor at the, in the Department of Journalism, Communication and Mass Media at the American University in Bulgaria. And he's uh, working on uh, social justice, ethics, documentary production. I think he's gonna tell us some more about his uh, field of work. And, but not, let, not last but least, he's also the um, co-founder with Svet Turnin and the programming, uh, director of programming of Cinema Politica, which is a nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to screening political documentaries in, the can in Canada and around the world. Well, um, after this introduction, I would like to um, ask my first question. Actually, I'm very curious about, because of, uh, uh, because of, of, of your um, different status in, in the film industry, Tamara, you're both a filmmaker and you're also working for a media fund in Canada and you're giving a lot of time on um, the questions of uh, equity, race, inclusion, um, all, at all, as well as I'm sure that you're thinking about the colonial structures and, 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 and inside uh, in North America, but also globally in filmmaking. Um, I'd like to know about your, like, uh, how do you combine these different positions which are not controversial, but at the same time, some time to time, it could be difficult to um, navigate between these different um, positions that you have in your daily practices. So keeping that in mind, uh, when you also think about in the broadest context that how to um, th uh, trace where this uh, funding uh, money comes from, or like how to, you know, have a like more equal and also um, ethically um, easy money, <laughs> like easy easy access to like uh, money to the, with, with, without really uh, bypassing our ethical cause. Like, how do you combine all these practices together when you're doing pursuing your different occupations? I know it's a loaded question, but it's <laughs> a loaded money conference. <laughs> I mean, just start wherever you, were, you want, and then we can continue with the flow. 
Sure, sure. Thank you for that question. Maybe also just a point of, of clarity. Um, actually, I am a founder of the Racial Equity Media Collective, but I am no longer a, a board member. I've stepped aside to, to leave that work to, to other equally skilled uh, people, um, including uh, Lisa Valencia Sanson, who I believe will actually be in person at Getting Real. So maybe we'll be able to connect with people there more so on that. Um, I am, however, a also a founding member of the East African Screen Collective, which does very similar work to the RAMC, um, but within the context of East Africa in relation to narrative sovereignty, uh, research and policy work, um, which very much you know, relates to your question about thinking about um, issues of, of authorship, of the positionality of the creators who are making content, um, which is something I think about in, in relation to financing, frankly, both wearing my Canadian hat um, and, and my Ethiopian hat when I'm working on the continent. Perhaps to come back to, to the question, I mean, how do I balance these things? Sometimes I don't know, it's, it's a lot of coffee. Um, but I think that, you know, the reason that I'm working for the Canada Media Fund is that as, as a Black female producer, as someone running a, a production company in Canada, for, for decades I could not raise money. The industry was not open to, to working with people who looked like me. We were not able to, to access, you know, institutions like the CMF. We weren't able to access broadcast licenses. And that's, that's why I had gone back to, to work in Ethiopia. I think the the push um, across North America and, and slowly the trickle into Europe to start to think about um, intersectionality and, and anti-racism as we work together as an industry and for funding institutions is, is what found sort of a happy marriage for me to be able to come internally within the Canada Media Fund and help them think through um, a lot of the, the changes that were required in terms of the structures within the CMF to access money and also to push within the industry more broadly in Canada to bring more partners to the table to make sure that we can do these things collectively and we can change the face of who, who, who is being financed to share Canadian stories and what are Canadian stories. Um, and that's really what a lot of that work is about. So it's me taking a step back from actively producing in Canada to make sure that there's more people that look like me in the decision-making rooms and also around the table being financed. Um, a lot of the work that I, I do in East Africa is, is within a similar lens that we don't have um, large funding institutions in Africa to, to go in and lobby against or be hired to work within. But I think when we come back to, to the issue of, of financing and the ethics of financing, it's quite different in, in the Canadian perspective because generically, or generally, sorry, a lot of the money is coming from government programs like it is in Europe. Um, it's coming from broadcasters and it's still tied up to government policy. So it is very much tied into the conversation of what is Canadian content and what is the cultural value um, and the, the cultural spend in, in terms of also the people who are being hired here in Canada. So I think in some respects, often, you know, perhaps tracing where the money came from is a little bit cleaner. But then when I think wearing my Ethiopian hat, there's a lot more levels of complexity of you know who, who controls the money, where did the money really come from? Um, and now even in Canada with the, the influence now of corporations entering the space, um, potentially being mandated to contribute to Canadian content by, by the government in the months ahead, these things are starting to change. And I think as producers, as creators, and even as, as financiers, we have to ask more questions about the intentions of the people who want to finance our content and to really make sure in the same way as if you're going to co-produce that you're aligned on the same um, artistic output and the same sort of aspects around creative control. Because at the end of the day, we don't want to be creating a new system where creators are suddenly accessing financing, but they've lost the, the ability to, to really direct their stories and where they've lost the ability to own and control the IP. Because for me, if you don't own the IP, you're really not going to be able to, to actu actually control the release and distribution and how your content shows up in the world. So I think that's a lot of answers <laughs> jumbled together. Yeah, I mean, uh, like, I really, uh, sorry to interrupt Tamara, but do you have any uh, specific, for example, examples comes to your mind uh, regarding Ethiopian context or Canadian and maybe in relation to both uh, in terms of like you had to deal with the ethical codes plus where the money comes from situation? 
Yeah, I mean, I, I think that it's hard for, for filmmakers often in East Africa to think about these questions of ethics because it's so difficult for them to get financing to begin with, that there mm -hmm. are certain films that I have seen accept money from corporate partners or from countries where personally sitting in Canada, I would have questions and I would be uncomfortable with. I mean, I come from working in international development. So, you know, we would do very in-depth and strict corporate social responsibility work before we would partner with anyone. Um, we don't really have have the luxury, I think, to, to be able to do that all the time. We don't have many people trying to fund our content in Africa for us to be able to sometimes say no or push back as much as we need to be able to. And I think that's where we need the support of larger international organizations um, and organizations like the IDA to help set up, you know, the terms of trade and, and what, what are the appropriate ethical approaches to, to the terms that, that funders are asking for so that mm -hmm. we can also uncover why are they really funding this content? What are they planning to do with it? And where did their money come from? Because I've certainly seen um, previously when I worked in the music industry, all sorts of washing of, of money from, from criminal enterprises coming through record labels. And, mm -hmm. and I'm quite concerned that um, that's going to be, you know, the next future of what's happening, especially with, with financing content in the global South, if we're not looking more deeply and asking these questions and understanding the power dynamics, um, especially between, between financiers, you know, in Europe who are coming into mm -hmm. Africa um, and who really has the control and the ownership of the content and who should are two separate things. Mm -hmm. I think you raised a lot of interesting questions. We'll, we'll go, come back to those in, in a different format. But before going to that, I'd like to ask Megan actually about her experience because I mean, I'd like to know actually, first of all, like in general, like the, what's the profile of the filmmakers that you're working closely with? And do you also uh, need to step in in terms of uh, some sort of negotiation with the other third party decision makers while you are also consulting uh, to them um, uh, through their journey of this making of this filmmaking. So do you intervene with the sort of, um, coding of the sort of power dynamics like between the filmmakers, producers and uh, financiers, broadcasters, other decision makers? Uh, great, that's a great question. So first I just wanna say thank you to the IDA for including me in this panel. I think this is an incredibly interesting panel and I feel honored to be a part of it and to have Catapult be a part of it. So thank you, IDA. Um, so uh, the first part of your question was sort of the films that we gravitate towards and the filmmakers that we gravitate towards. So um, Catapult is usually kind of a first supporter, maybe a second supporter on nonfiction projects. So just in terms of the timeline, we're usually coming in like three to five years before that film makes its way out into the world. Um, sometimes up to a decade. I mean, independent films can be difficult to figure out what your story is, um, and we're along for the ride. Um, but the point of talking about that is there's a, it's a period of great questions. You know, you're still very early on in your thinking and what you want your project to be and who you want to be in your project and what story you're really trying to tell. And so when we come in early, we're looking for filmmakers not only who have a great story and great characters and beautiful access, but who are really asking um, great questions and who are really open to trying to, you know, who are approaching their topic with great curiosity, which I think tends to lead filmmakers to whatever that compelling moral question is that's at the center of every great film. Um, so that's the kind of films we gravitate towards. Your question about do we intervene? Um, once we come on board a project, we become advocates and advisors for those films for the whole journey. Right now we're consulting with two films that we came on to five years ago on their Oscar campaign. So we advocate and advise those filmmakers. And I think the invisible thread of um, all of that advice and all that advocacy that we give is advocating for the filmmaker. That's your film. This is the film that you've been working years and years of your life on probably haven't been paid very much. You should make the film that you wanna make um, and to ask yourself continually, what is the story I'm trying to tell? How do I wanna bring this film out into the world? Whatever your answer is, is the right answer. 
Um, another bit of advice that we do give, and it's um, a, a little bit of, a, of an anecdote, is a filmmaker that we were working very closely with was offered some controversial money and felt uh, concerned. You know, they were, they were, they needed money. I mean, all filmmakers need money, right? We've got this great panel, filmmakers got to eat. A filmmaker does have to eat. But on the other hand, you can always say no. No one has a gun to your head. No one is forcing you to take the money. So I advise filmmakers, apply. Apply for the money that you need. See which money you get. And then interrogate at that moment if this is the right partnership for you. Don't apply for stuff that you know, you just know you wouldn't want on under any circumstance, but it's an incredibly competitive landscape. So you might not even get it anyway. So, uh, but understand that even if you apply and even if you get it, you can still say no. Like you're always in the position of saying no and remembering that you're in control. This is your project that you're working on for many, many years. And the ultimate decision is, should always, always be yours. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. Um, this kind of uh, reminds me of what Lisa does. Actually, I'd like to know more. Uh, Lisa, um, do you always get the most controversial cases or you always, uh, I mean, you are also in some smooth productions that you are like um, specialized in like uh, helping them through in their legal journey. Uh, what would you say about like the cases that you're dealing with. Do you have any examples for us that you step in as a negotiator? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, I don't know if any nonfiction project is ever easy. It's always, there's always a challenge that's unexpected. And one day I'll learn that because when I talk to clients initially, they're like, it's a really simple project. I have all the funding in place. This is this, I have, you know, everything's all in order and everything's perfectly tied up in a, with a bow and it's just gonna be delivered. It never is that way. Um, so they're all complicated and challenging in different ways, but I would say, you know, just looking at the financing front and how much things have changed over the last decade, let's say, um, where a decade ago and even 15 years ago, I mean, documentaries were sort of the stepchild, like the ugly stepchild. I don't know if we can still say that, but that was like, you know, they weren't the cool kids on the block. And now documentary films and nonfiction content is so popular, so desired by streaming platforms and everybody else. And the budgets have gone up, the quality has gone up, the subject matter has really changed. And so while certain things with regard to financing were really no-nos 10 years ago, now it's sort of like anything goes. And my advice always to clients is just to know what you're getting into. And you know, we have several clients who do um, the bulk of their work on, on musicians and really popular artists and they know what the gig is the gig is this artist is going to get paid the artist is going to have approval rights the artist is going to be involved in the making of this movie and that's totally fine you know the artist might have producer credit there's all sorts of things but i'm like that's that movie and as long as we're being honest about what that is then that's okay if you want to do an expose on someone or really dive deep into some story that maybe authorization isn't the right way to go then you know that that person's not going to get paid and you're going to be filming in, in a totally different way. And the funding's going to come from a different source. So I think that ever since really the streaming platforms got really involved and they obviously really turned into more of a studio model where they would have final approval where before it was more, sorry, I'm freezing. Can you guys hear me? Okay. Can you hear me? Okay. Yes. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, before, you know, it's like Megan was talking about with the catapult model where you get into, you get in equi private equity and you make your movie, they wouldn't have any say, they would be passive investors and these filmmakers would go out and make their movie and come back and whatever it was, it was. And that those days have really changed where that still exists. And that's wonderful. And I love when clients do movies that way because they really have the power to make the movie they want to make. But even if it's a streaming platform who's coming on that is either financing it or coming on to pick it up, they're ultimately going to have final cut anyway. So you're ultimately very often answering to a higher power, use that word as you may, but it, it's really is a very different landscape, even for us legally um, in terms of what the legal work looks like and what the financing has to look like and what all the production work looks like, uh, because it's just a, it's a different um, it's a different landscape and there's more eyeballs, there's more popularity and there's just more money involved. 
Um, do you take, uh, like, do you represent um, international filmmakers as well, or just do you work as a US-based um, attorney? You know, pretty much US-based. I would say the international um, projects we work on are US-based producers who are doing things abroad. And typically, so we, we don't do a lot of international finance. If that's the case, we will bring on lawyers in that jurisdiction to help with the financing in that, in that case. But um, so mostly US-based projects. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Lisa. Um, now I'd like to think together, maybe Ezra can help me through that, that it's also a case that it's not just the, like, of course, the monetary side of things, but at the same time, like filmmakers are facing the um, like exchanges while they're composing their narratives and the way that they're telling their stories. And uh, usually with the decision makers and their uh, certain structures are kind of uh, stepping as formalizing their way of telling the story. So it's just uh, the question of like the, the artistic integrity or autonomy, is it is it going to be lost or like in, to, to what extent there, there could be some, you know, um, negotiations in terms of like um, Hampering or like the fulfilling the, the decision makers bodies um, uh, perspectives in, in in seeing how the story should be told or can be told. So um, when you're working on the on the ethics and um, also like reception of the films, Ezra, do you also work on the special or like concrete cases with the filmmakers or about the films? Um, thinking about these topics, uh, would you like to share? with us, your experience in, in, in your field work? Sure, thank you for the question. And I also wanna say thanks to Abby and the IDA and everybody in front of, behind and beside the cameras who contributed to this amazing uh, discussion that we're having right now. Um, <clears throat> I My focus really is on on film festivals and on the circulation, curation and reception of documentary cinema. And as a curator, um, I'm very interested in curatorial ethics. And so for instance, I'll start right away with a real world example, but some years ago, we a very good uh, environmental film came our way and we said no to it because it was um, sponsored, uh, partly funded by Lush Cosmetics. And we knew that Lush Cosmetics had engaged in an anti seal hunting campaign that was quite aggressive. And so this was a values misalignment with us in the ways in which our organization, Cinema Politica, supports Inuit sovereignty. Um, and so we explained all that though to the filmmakers and they were very gracious and totally understood. And it was an interesting moment where I just wish more conversations happened like that. Um, and to switch kind of into the festival realm, I just wanna start with an opening credo that I think is probably a little bit, um, uh, uh, of course, will be controversial for some, but I, this is what I think, and and this is because I'm really I'm really focused on film festivals, and film festivals, of course, have become increasingly important to uh, the documentary world, not just as platforms for showcasing uh, films, but also for funding films, for that is for connecting filmmakers to funders. Uh, but also to actually producing films and having their own production funds. Um, and what I think is that companies and corporations that are directly contributing to injustices should never be welcomed, empowered, or rewarded at any festival focused on or championing documentary film. I'm going to say in Canada, because of the earlier discussion, Tamara rightly pointed out that situations are different geopolitically, um, and in Canada is, the, is where I know best. And also, there is no need in Canada for the invitation to such companies. And um, I think that there's a cognitive dissonance and an institutional disconnect between the money and the message. And this is allowed to exist, again, I believe, because, the, the, because we, that is the documentary community that I consider myself part of, has absorbed and naturalized a narrative that you can't make art or display or display or share it at festivals without some major or minor ethical compromise because money has to come from somewhere. Filmmakers, it's got to eat. Uh, uh, that came up earlier, 
And for me, this is a crisis of imagination and a values disconnect in an industry so invested in creative imagination and community values, right? So I think that we need to support uh, existing alternative models and forge new models that do not extend the ethically problematic commercial model in the documentary world. Um, mm -hmm. And I want to and I want to say also that uh, that it has to be intersectional festivals. Uh, part of this, uh, like not inviting uh, Coca Cola to sponsor your environmental film section, as Hot Docs did many years ago. Um, it also needs to be that festivals need to diversify their their admin and their staff so that it reflects the diversity of the, the communities and societies that they serve and that they're engaged with and that they're embedded in and not just their frontline volunteers because racialized capital intersects uh, with um, these these problems uh, of, of the, like the lack of diversity is 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 interconnected in all of this so um, so that's why I'm like, I'm so focused on festivals because I love them so much. And these, this is our community hubs. This is our place where we go and meet each other and, and new, new relationships are forged and people get to sh share their work and see work. And I think that we're so appreciative of these spaces because they're really, um, they're really kind of uh, put forward as, as alternative spaces to kind of more hyper commercialized spaces. But I, but I see that there's a corruption of, of that space that is uh, through these corporate uh, partnerships. And I want to say, especially with banks, every major festival in Canada now is sponsored by a bank. Banks are part of the problem. They are not part of the solution, period. Mm -hmm. And so at Hot Docs, you have Scotiabank big ideas. We should not be going to Scotiabank for any ideas. They invented offshore banking. You know, this is RBC and TIFF. RBC is the has been the biggest funder of the tar sands in Alberta. I mean, this is this is all you know. Th th this has happened under our under our noses, and I think we need to, as someone already said, we need to be asking more questions. Um, but also, we need to be demanding more from our institutions that we're part of and that cannot exist without us supporting them. Ezra, thank you. Actually, it's kind of flourished a lot of ideas in my mind. But first of all, I'd like to share a note from Abby, our um, conference director. She said that this uh, session called uh, Filmmakers Must Eat is a former one now. Now it's changed to Filmmakers Must Make a Rent uh, in order to not to make a light of, uh, of, uh, of global hunger, actually. So that's just a uh, change in that direction, which is a good development. Um, okay, I'd like to continue because the, the, the last, I mean, the last point was huge actually, but still I'd like to continue with the last point of, 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 of filmmakers needs to also make a living and filmmakers also needs to make their films. And it's not equal uh, in, in the globe that, that there are like uh, filmmakers in the quote unquote global South or the filmmakers who, are, who has an immigrant background living in the global North filmmakers from different backgrounds or uh, racial or ethnic um, backgrounds that also that um, neurodiverse backgrounds, disability, etc. So the filmmakers are not equal, but they also need equal rights to make a living on, the, uh, on, on their um, pursuit. I'd like to know um, that this question goes to Tamara and Ezra, but uh, Megan and Lisa feel free to also interrupt that um, is there, I mean, do you think that uh, uh, filmmakers are expected to, uh, expected to depict stories in certain ways in order to get uh, their films funded or in order to get their films to be distributed, uh, curated, be on the festival? So do you think that filmmakers are pushed into, a, I, I think so, but just let's talk about it. Like, Push to some certain uh, way of telling their stories in order to be, have funding, distribution, attention, uh, a place in the world, and also, yeah, to exist uh, with their um, dignity. So, what do you think? I think it creates a lot of problems in terms of like negotiating with their own artistic vision. Um, and they also, I mean, like artistic vision versus uh, the expectations of the market in general, market and film festivals. 
It also brings the filmmakers into the point that they need to negotiate, they need to adapt, they need to sometimes make uh, some um, compensations. So Tamara, would you like to take up this from this point and give us your thoughts and examples? Sure. Sure, I, I think this is this is a huge issue um, in terms of the the creative freedoms, um, especially if we talk about in in the Canadian context, um, racialized and indigenous creators who are now starting to get access into the system. Um, but I think to, to Ezra's point, we have a lot of interference from large corporations, um, banks, and also telecom um, that is coming into the space and setting up some of these you know new and specialized funds targeting these communities. Uh, but I think, and, and even I've seen calls for, for funding applications in the U.S. targeted towards BIPOC creators. And there seems to be this focus, sometimes clearly stated in, in those calls for applications, and sometimes it's just the belief held within the community of what people, what stories people think will be authentic coming from our communities. And this is why I really don't like this, this use of the word authentic storytelling. Um, because there are hundreds of different stories that I can tell you as, as a Black woman, as an Ethiopian, I'm also part Ukrainian, I can dig into that if I want to, um, but I think it's just this idea that oh, we have to tell these sad historical stories and we have to, to show you this um, poverty porn when we look into stories coming out of Africa, but we also have other stories that are just everyday stories about what happens on the street that I live on, or maybe we want to tell you a science fiction story, um, or just stories of joy. I think that there is this, this push that these are the things that we should finance that are about our grief, and yes, sometimes those are the stories that need to be told because we need to find ways through art to deal with our experiences and to deal with how our stories have been stolen and how our stories have been misrepresented by other communities. Um, but I think, you know, as, as a funder at the CMF, we don't have a program that says if you're Black or Indigenous, bring us your sad, woe is me story. We just want you to bring us your stories and the stories that you feel you want to tell to the world. And I think that's the the pivot that more funders have to be thinking about and those are the requirements i think as as communities that that we have to also push out and and really rally against uh, new funders that are entering the space is that we should not be dictating to creators the type of stories that they should tell they should be telling us the type of stories that they need to be telling and i just also wanted to sort of double down on what i said earlier which which megan touched on a bit and and also lisa it's just the situation is totally different for creators in the global south. If there is no one who's willing to fund your thing, I've seen filmmakers take money from from countries and from institutions that they don't want to. But if you know, speaking of eating and living and dancing as a creator, if they don't take that money and deal with those really really shitty terms, they are not going to make their film or they are not going to pay their rent. So I think the the ability to say I'm not comfortable with that is just it's not there. It's either I take that or or I, I don't eat or I don't work. Um, and I think that also being able to access someone like Lisa to help with your contract and help to push back. It's, it's just not affordable. So I think, you know, those are the things we also have to think about as an industry is how do we we support those creators? How do we give them access to more services that help with with making sure that they're not getting totally screwed over in the terms and also just pushing back and saying, you know what, as funders, we're not funding any more extractive films. Um, if I see anyone else that's that's not Ethiopian or not working equitably with Ethiopians making films in Ethiopia, I will really lose it because I've been on many panels yelling about that. Um, and we just have to stop because this is all part of the same issue. We're taking up space and we're limiting the, the access of these creators to tell their stories and they have so little access to money, never mind money that's clean. So hopefully that, that <laughs> answer, a bunch of things all at once. Yeah, before going to Ezra, as I said before, uh, just keep in mind that question, please. Um, Lisa, would you like to, Give us an, uh, like an example or an experience. You also had to defend a filmmaker within the U.S. structure that uh, um, poses rights under um, under fire, under under attack. Yeah. Like in terms of like, yeah. Could you say something about it? 
Yeah, and also just to put a, a, a tiny bit of a more um, optimistic spin on what Tamara's saying is, you know, it is, I think it is a struggle for some filmmakers to decide, you know, do I want to take this money from this organization or do I not? Do I want to give up these creative rights or do I not? And ideally they probably don't want to, but it is an opportunity for them to tell their story, maybe in a slightly different way, maybe with some controls over it. Maybe it's not so bad, but I, I always go back to this point of transparency and honesty. Like, let's be real about what you're doing now. Now this funder's on board. So now it's not going to be exactly what you may not be exactly what you wanted to do at the beginning, but are you okay with doing this new story? Because where I find the real trouble comes in with filmmakers is just the conflict of they kind of have this idea that, well, I can still tell my story. And it's like, maybe you can, maybe you can't. But I just feel like that transparency is an honesty with the, with the filmmaker themselves and with others is what kind of makes people feel more comfortable with that situation. Um, and then just in terms of like the, the deal points that we can negotiate, there are things to negotiate. You know, often sophisticated funders will have very specific things that they need and they won't negotiate off that. They're like, we want Final Cut. We want you to tell this point of view. We don't want you to interview this person. It could get as detailed as that. You know, we hope it does not. Um, but often what I found is if it's a funder who's not involved in the nonfiction film space, and they just want to tell a story that's maybe good for their brand or enhances their industry, that there is some wiggle room. You know, I do think that they listen to things where we say, listen, we can't give you final cut. You have to trust the director that you're hiring to execute his creative vision. And if we give you final cut, we're not going to be able to sell this thing because it is true that many outlets will not take a production that is that has final cut by an interested source. So, or that has any sort of approval rights. And sometimes we can tell them that like, listen, this compromise is not only the integrity of the film and the, the journalistic integrity, but it also compromises the viability. Like, do, you do you want this thing to get out? Do you want this to be on a streaming platform? Or are you gonna put this up on your own website? Like, so I think that there is, there is ways to negotiate and to make the filmmaker um, have more power than maybe initially the, the brand or the company or whoever it is is financing wants. Um, and I think we can have those collegial reason conversations of, you know, we don't want Final Cut just because we want Final Cut. We want Final Cut for these really legitimate reasons and for the viability of the project, which is good for everybody. Um, so there are things that we can negotiate in that realm, um, even if you have like a corporate, let's say a corporate funder. Um, so yeah, so those are just kind of the ways I deal with, but I always go back to that area of truth and, mm -hmm. and just sitting with what does this mean for my film now and getting comfortable with that maybe looking at a new way to approach it as opposed to i'm really compromising my integrity you know that's not a good feeling that anybody wants to have mm -hmm. yeah thank you lisa um i'd like to go back to my previous question now and like uh, asking to ezra that what do you think that the filmmakers have are been through in terms of like comp compromising their like views visions story uh and being pushed by the selection committees or like the curatorial uh, teams is expectations. What do you think about this? Well, first of all, um, it's a very real thing. And there's something called the festival film, which is its own kind of subgenre of what is expected to be shown at a festival. And so it, to me, it comes back to the question of power and who has power to decide and shape documentary culture. And it actually comes back to something Tamara said earlier about, I think it was Tamara, um, about we need larger organizations to kind of work on these things. And some things I know you said about autonomy and autonomy is really connected to something I'm set, obsessed with, which is structure and agency. So how, how do filmmakers find agency in these structures that are structuring the culture even, and that, that there is some agency because structure and agency work back and forth, but the best way to have um, agency in institutions is collectively. So we need to also, I think, not think of individual filmmakers, but think of filmmakers that are part of a larger um, artistic creative labor group or um, interpretive community, whatever we want to call them, that are all that are working on similar projects that I think could be do well to get together more often and insist, for instance, you know, this panel's called Loaded Pictures, and it made me think uh, 
that maybe we need like a documentary disarmament treaty um, where uh, if the if the money's if the money's dirty dirty but the pictures are clean you know dirty money clean pictures um, that maybe we need to really focus on this as more of a collective and one of the things that I've really pushed for uh, in in the stuff that I write is for festivals to have to publish uh, their ethical guidelines and their best practices. Why do you take money from this uh, from this embassy, but you don't from this embassy? For instance, someone's making a decision in private. We want to know why. Why is Amazon at the table suddenly uh, out of nowhere and someone else now isn't? Uh, and now they're giving money to filmmakers. How? What are the policies around these major decisions about mm -hmm. resource allocation? So I think that... Um, that we need to insist more transparency and we need to insist more involvement in these institutions that are publicly funded and again that mm -hmm. that can't exist without us and that includes yeah maybe of maybe they, they, they also just go where the money is but it's just <laughs> um yeah it's just an interpretation but yeah the transparency i think is, is very key here um, Megan, uh, what would be your commentary about this question of this broad question of the artistic integrity and the expectations of the so-called decision makers? Like, uh, how do you deal with this question in your daily practices? <clears throat> yeah, this is great. And I'm excited to have the opportunity to answer this question because I think there is a certain strategy that filmmakers should be thinking about, about developing their ideas. I think in the very early stages, you want to stay... Um, kind of as insular with your creative team as possible. So you aren't accountable. It is the most um, free and open moment of a project because you don't really have a lot of partners at that time. It, you know, maybe Catapult will come in and we'll really be supporting, you know, just you and your development of your idea. Um, but when you think about the the lifespan of a project as it it kind of goes on an X, Y axis, you know, like the money and the idea. And you want to really be thinking about where do you need to really lay down the pillars of your idea? Um, and if you really gird your idea strongly in the beginning, you're well capable of dealing with complicated situations, you know, as they come down the pike. Because the more you know what you want to do, especially if it's a creative or unique idea, um, the better you are in a position to negotiate with future larger partners or to turn away a future larger partner because you really are very clear on what you want to say and how you want to say it. Do you have any specific examples you'd like to share at the moment or not like uh, without giving names but maybe but just describing these contexts better for us? Um, right. So I can speak sort of broadly and it is especially around, um, uh, this idea of experimental filmmaker or kind of like developing an idea, um, especially if you want to kind of, uh, tell a different kind of story, you don't, you know, it's not traditional. I think it is, um, I'm trying, I don't want to like kind of share specific stories, but as you are developing your idea, you really want to lean into whatever the asset is that is the strongest part of your idea, um, whether that's a unique, you know, piece of archival material that you're like building it around, or it's a very special access that you've really, everyone's going to interrogate your access when you start, start taking that film out into the world. So uh, look carefully and creatively at what you're trying to do before you start bringing in big partners, knowing that big partners are going to want to have a say in it. So as much as you're able to develop your idea kind of not cheaply, but not too expensively, you know, keep it close, keep your cards close to your chest as you're really developing it, create a brain trust around your idea. And really, uh, before you bring it out into the world, have it really clear in your own mind and your creative team's mind. Yeah, thank you so much. I mean, I, it would be great if we had a filmmaker. I mean, we have Tamara, but she's mostly representing her decision-making um, practices. But 
I really wonder if you'd like one of you share uh, your opinion about, or all of you that, what if a filmmaker, I, I agree that, that filmmakers, some of the filmmakers doesn't have a choice to track, uh, or even though they track the source of the money, say no to that money because they really need to make it, um, make their living and make the film. But there are also, of course, some ethical, um, ethical decisions are intervening in this process. There should be, and it really depends on filmmakers themselves um, decision with their producers and maybe and also in negotiation with their protagonists because you know usually uh, documentary makers are are dealing with controversial issues which is like uh, important for their sociopolitical uh, en environment and also for their audience so I think that if what if there is there is a filmmaker who has to uh, who who is go who has to face some sort of uh, that their um, audience turns turn up against them, you know, because of the decision that they made in finishing their film, and then the film is finished. The people, I mean, it's out there; it's been taking very well, but then some sort of you know uh, nasty um, <laughs> information are known or learned about this uh, financing structure of that very film. Would yeah. you like to comment I can, on I such can a? Share. I I can share a story about that in general terms, mm -hmm. um, you know, and this was a few years ago, but I had a client who was very accustomed to creating their own stories, financing it independently, having complete autonomy on the creation of the content and then selling it and was relatively successful in doing that. Um, and then they were approached by a brand to do, um, to do a story about something that impacted their brand and it was it wasn't controversial it was actually sort of a fun story um about like a, a sports kind of industry and um and he really struggled with that he struggled with can I take this corporate money and make this movie is that going to compromise my integrity as a filmmaker is that going to compromise my ability to make movies in the future because people think I'm a director for hire who will just you know do this type of thing and he really struggled with the decision of whether or not to do that and I thought it was it was the total appropriate struggle because he was entering into it knowing what he was getting into it wasn't a disillusionment um, but also knowing that this company really trusted him in his filmmaking style and wanted him to make this movie um, and I think being that it wasn't a real controversial subject, he went in and it was a thing like he had to live like he was like, this is a great payday for me. Um, and kind of at the end of the day decided that he could do this as a one off. And I think that was successful. He did it. He created a, a good film for the brand. The brand was happy. He's able to now continue to do the same stuff he wanted to. But it's almost I, I don't know if this is really a fair comparison, but, you know, back in the day, documentary filmmakers didn't make a living off doing documentary films they would be commercial producers or they direct sitcoms or they would they do something else in the commercial world to sustain and to live and now it's kind I mean it's kind of a nice thing that they can now be documentary filmmakers full-time and sometimes do a piece like this that is that allows them to pay the rent and then move on to something else that maybe that is funded privately that they can do that it's really more of a passion project for them. So I think that worked out really nicely and it kind of like bridged the gap between those two things. Um, I know that doesn't always work out that way, but it, it is it was that he feel like he was able to keep his own integrity in on the creation of this, understanding exactly what it was, and then getting the paycheck and then moving on and doing something else that was more passionate he was more passionate about. Thank you so much, Lisa. Is there anyone who wants to shortly comment on what Lisa said, or in general? Can I, can, can I just yeah. can I just say one thing that um, I just want to? I don't want to temper the enthusiasm too much, but I, I'd say the majority of documentary filmmakers still don't make a living uh, doing it. At least the ones I know, and most of them do have side gigs. Um, and I think that's part of that's part of this whole discussion, right? Is like mm -hmm. I know filmmakers that are making environmental films but also making commercials for sometimes problematic companies and they're juggling this you know ethics and economics monster all the time and the one thing i think is really important and this is you know just part of being human in the social world is trying to find values alignment do my values align with this with this activity with this entity yes or no how much do they not align 
okay, how can I, you know, how can I negotiate so that they do or whatever? I think that's a really important question that because documentary filmmakers aren't in, invested in making fantasy films, they're making, you know, they're representing lived uh, experience and often um, the, the subjects are people that are underrepresented um, and don't have access to power. So it's a very important question to have values alignment, I think. That was all I wanted to say, sorry. Yeah, thank, thank you, thank you, Ezra. Uh, Megan, do, would you like to say something? I just wanted to agree with Ezra. Um, I, I do think uh, a lot of filmmakers, extremely talented, experienced filmmakers are still struggling to make a viable living doing this work and often are doing kind of a bunch of things, you know, paying Peter to pay Paul or whatever that phrase is. And I think, um, the conversation used to very much be about sustainability. Um, maybe, you know, four or five years ago, uh, I feel like we veered off and we've realized that there are a lot of things that need to be in the conversation, but I'm a big advocate of bringing the conversation back to sustainability because I do think it's yeah. really important in this field. Um, and I think the yeah. more people really understand, the, the better off we all are going to be. Um, and that's great that at the at the IDA's uh, Getting Real uh, conference uh, program, there are many parallel and like um, parallel conferences which are also dealing with these issues, other than the uh, one that is, um, what was the name again? Oh, sorry, like uh, filmmakers must make rent, fans, like yeah. all the I, other I just stuff. Think, I think these big sales get a lot of press, um, and mm -hmm. I think it. Um, it, it kind of un it, it gives a, a little bit of a of an incorrect view of what the ecosystem looks like more broadly. Um, you know the twenty yeah. million dollar sale of of the Magic Johnson. I, it's just that's a it's a rare bird, and I'm excited for that. Yeah, that's not most people's lived experience here. Yeah, I mean, a hundred percent. I totally agree with both of you guys, but I do want to say, you know, I think that's any industry, you know, you see actors and actors are so well paid. Most of the actors are not working. You know, I think anyone who works in the arts, they're going to have a struggle. It's a harder job than, you know, yeah. some others. Absolutely. So you're going to have a struggle, but it is, I do want to, I always like to focus on the positive and maybe to a fault, but it's like, this is a boom of documentary filmmaking and there's more documentary filmmakers than ever who are making a living and yes that number is not like it's not a great percentage still and there's still a lot of struggling people struggling filmmakers um but there is this is a good momentum and it is a, a good time for nonfiction filmmaking and hopefully it just continues and um, i mean lisa thank you for the optimistic view actually i also agree oh. that the nonfiction uh, filmmaking and nonfiction cinema is having its um, peak and globally uh, it's great that the stories of nonfiction film comes from the nonfiction films is just uh, being more and more understood or like giving chances to through different um, funding or supporting systems globally in the world. I have to say that, I mean, this conversation is so good. I mean, I'm really enjoying my time together with you, but I think we reached to our time limits here. I would like to get, uh, if you have any last comments, and especially Tamara, if you if you would like to say something because uh, for a while you didn't speak, but just let us know if you wanna share something on this last conversation or just in general. No, I mean, I, I think I've said the things I wanna say, but maybe in, in, in summary, I think we've still kept coming back to sort of, um, or maybe it's mostly us as the two Canadians, this, standards and in, in terms of trades and like ethical policies that we should align on as as an industry um as as industry organizations and, and as funders and i think if we have that framework and if we can't get everyone around the table then if a few organizations come in and start to do that we can make a case for having more fair and ethical practices and then we can bring the other people in kicking and screaming as we go um, I mean, like, really, like, we should continue this uh, panel as a second <laughs> phase, like a series, because now I have more ideas, like the, like, integrity, uh, global integrity of the decision makers and what could be done for our industry as the next panel uh, idea that I just propose now. Hopefully, we will have other platforms to discuss it together or separately. Uh, I'm very glad that uh, 
we had this discussion today with all of you. Uh, I'd like to thank on behalf of IDA, Getting Real team and myself. Um, I think we are about to finish uh, our session now. And so I'd like to say goodbye to our audience. I uh, hope you enjoyed. Thank you. Thank you. Bye, everybody.